I hate to say this one, but there's certainly an element of just like tolerance that exists. And so because I've been through certain things, it like the stuff that I deal with right now like pales in comparison. So um, there's just an element of like when I wake up in the morning, like I'm just very happy to be here and, and not two years ago. And I think that so that is probably a testament to certain things that I do in my day to day or weekly life. But they're very basic. And I think whatever I'm most of the things that I do are things that like they're a good therapist would, would recommend for someone. Shout out to you. No, I mean, um, there's, I mean, there's other things that I, that I could do better with in terms of sleep and, um, Hey, 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 it's still one thing at a time. Yeah. It's one, it's, no, <laughs> it's, it's still one thing at a time. Mental Health Monday. Alright, welcome back to another episode of Mental Health Monday. Here with my boy Peter. What up, boy, man? I uh, appreciate that. I think we should open up with you talking about what mania is like before we start uh, playing cards. Because what All I'm going right. to do is I'm going to make the interview a part one and a part two. Because we're wearing different clothes, so everyone will obviously know you guys came back to talk. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. But yeah, you were like, it's a, um, it's like drinking six cups of espresso. Yeah. So yeah. we we're live now. Yeah, yeah, we're live. Okay. Now. Yeah, I mean, you like I do that. Make sure to like create the space. Like, I right, now, now we're live. You're good. Yeah. No, yeah. well, I just uh, you know, it's it's always when. You, it's always nice to know. So. Mm -hmm. um, That's but, seven right there. Yeah, uh, seven. So. Yeah, mania. Seven. There are so many different layers to it. Mm -hmm. I think that that the decreased need for sleep mm -hmm. is fundamental to it. Yeah. Um, and because you become so intoxicated on what's going on mm -hmm. when you when you've never experienced mania, at least this was how it was uh, the first time I went through it. Mm -hmm. um, where you don't want it to end. I mean, you really think something special might be happening in your life or you're, you're just, your drive is unmatched. Mm -hmm. And it, it, for me, that ended in involuntary hold in the hospital, which we've talked about previously. Mm -hmm. The more and more you get used to being manic, if Unfort if that's your path, yeah. then your third or fourth time being manic, you reach this brick wall after a day or two of being in a, in a manic state mm -hmm. where you're just thinking, someone t like turn deactivate my brain, like and that, not, turn it just off. turn it off. Not even like I want to go to sleep. It's mm -hmm. it literally feels like you know there's there's some on and off switch that yeah. that needs to be pressed. Do you think that's what leads people sometimes to taking their lives because they can't turn it off? Uh, could be. I'm sh you know, it's sad, but there's probably cases mm -hmm. where that, that goes on. You know, they, they also... Because th there's a limit to yeah. like being in that physical and mental state of a manic episode. And there's different levels of a manic episode, too. Yeah. So, <clears throat> like, your manic episode isn't going to be the same as someone else's manic episode or what it feels like to be manic. No, no. I mean, there's definitely things that that people share in common. Mm -hmm. um, not, like I said, I think that the, the decreased need for sleep and the drive is something where I've now had the chance to meet other people who, who have a bipolar one condition and yeah. a lot of us relate on that that stuff mm -hmm. and the risk taking and um, but the the most definitive aspect of my mania and mm -hmm. i think the mania of some of my bipolar peers 
is just that personal narrative that's going on in your head and grappling with it. Like, mm-hmm. just your, your, I mean, the psychosis, to use the medical term. Yeah. Um, now, there's plenty of people who've been manic in some capacity or, like, hypomanic without psychosis kicking in. Also, I think it's your... What's your... Uh, what's a manic versus hypomanic? It's your turn. Um, <coughs> so... Uh, hypomanic mm-hmm. is typically well, you know you could have put out two eights at the same time right I got stuff up my sleeve okay I think cool. no, I got nah it. I mean I should have done that yeah. <laughs> I, I, I'm just getting loose you know it's first you. game uh, green green mm-hmm. alright um, let's go red okay So, uh, so hypomanic, Mm -hmm. it's a little bit briefer. Some people think that, uh, there's one thing I've discussed with certain people about hypomania is that you blew, you can, you can halt a hypomanic episode without medication Mm -hmm. so someone could kind of be existing in their life hypomanic and it might be more social passing and Mm -hmm. you wouldn't really know that it's going on and then their hypomania might just end after a few days or a week and they they kind of just have that period and it's like just a little bit more about the motivational factor Mm -hmm. than it is about um, just the the sense of reality and the drive and the risk taking mm-hmm. and I, you know I'm not a professional yeah. so since like yeah, no, you know, no, this, so, is, this, yeah, is, this just is just my from this is from my experience but yeah. but um, and then that's it you uno, 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 uno out. Remember, if you don't, I say you said no uno, then you got to draw two more cards. Okay, I'll yeah. draw. No, two no, more. no, no. You're fine. You're yeah. fine. I know we had the talk last time, but it's like we're back. Just got to remind yeah. you. Uh, so right now it's one to know. Yeah. Bet, bet, bet. My bet. man came back with a vengeance. I have to. Yeah, yeah, of course, of course. After last time. But, <laughs> yeah. So, mm-hmm. I don't know. Um, but there's an, hypomania. You don't necessarily need medication to mm-hmm. halt it. A lot of people who have experienced hypomania or would consider themselves to be bipolar too. Mm -hmm. They don't take mood stabilizers. Like that's not a big part. That may not be a big part of their treatment regimen. I mean, certainly there are cases of that, Um, but I'd say that's it. That the way that you respond to someone who's bipolar two versus bipolar one is actually very different. That that I I can say with some level of certainty. just because so when you say respond to someone what do you mean like in conversation or to when they're having an episode the treatment the treatment plan Mm -hmm. uh also even responding to them because like i said that the bipolar 2 is a little bit less detectable Mm -hmm. so there's probably you know people out there who have co-workers or classmates that may have experienced hypomania there may even be people themselves who have experienced hypomania and not realized it Mm -hmm. um because they haven't you know taken time to address their mental health the so i i I don't i try not to think too much about the labels but there's definitely some some starker differences between bipolar one and bipolar two than just like um the number and I think they sound very similar Mm -hmm. um but the 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 depictions of bipolar disorder that you often see in the media Mm -hmm. or in movies Mm -hmm. more often than not are kind of like caricatures and extreme portrayals of bipolar one Mm -hmm. um so AKA their research isn't really done. They just have this association with the thing. 
yeah it's just so it's again because it's also such an internal thing mm -hmm. it's i it's very hard to to do it justice in film mm -hmm. and a lot of people's are doing the draw to skip right mm -hmm. yeah i think a lot of people's experience with bipolar <clears throat> one as an outsider is like the burden or the 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 sort of Traumatic is the right word, but hard experiences, seeing their their peers go through it, kind of the, the awkwardness, mm -hmm. and um, so I don't know. It's like only really ten percent of the story. Okay. Yeah. Is it your turn or my turn? It's a uh, skip, skip. You played. It's my turn. Okay. Good. Yeah. Have you, what's it like to come out of a manic episode? Like, is it like one of those moments where you're looking at a blurred background and you're like, what the fuck happened? Yeah, I mean, when we, today when we talk about the, the rest of that, of my journey coming out of the hospital in that year, yeah, mm -hmm. coming out of the manic episode for me yeah. is harder than the episode itself. Mm -hmm. It shouldn't really be compared, but those the hardest months of my life have been post mania, grappling with some like pretty serious depression, mm -hmm. and not really knowing what to do about it. No out yellow. Wow, master master play. <laughs> I just had it. I was like, yeah. do it the other way. I was like, no, <laughs> if you if you move the draw four to the back, you're out. This yeah. is it. Yeah, it's it's one move. And I I, I ended if mm -hmm. if I were to have drawn four cards, yeah. I would have had eleven cards to end the game. So, <laughs> Damn. Yeah, you you worked me. Ah, thank you. Yeah. But I am listening. This is very fascinating to me because uh, everyone's episodes have been different. Mm -hmm. You get what I'm saying? So mm -hmm. like, I knew people who had episodes that were on the edge, and they were like, "Look, I can't take the medicine because the medicine does something to me." Right? Yeah. And I knew people who were, you would never know at any point that that person was just living in a perpetual episode of existence. And for mm -hmm. me, I was like, that's, that's nuts. Cause you just, you're having very great general conversation and they would be like, yeah, but like right now this, this is what my episode looks like. Yeah. It's just calmly happening in front of my eyes. And I'm just like. Just gotta make it to the beginning, and I gotta make it to the end. Those yeah. are my two rules. Yep. Yep. I think the the I mean the medication thing is mm -hmm. the common struggle. I that was part of what was difficult coming out of the first episode was adjusting to that, and mm -hmm. it takes a little bit before you feel like yourself again on the meds. Mm -hmm. But that that. Going back to the six cups of espresso thing, I mean, you're on cloud nine That's in some cases when you're manic, mm -hmm. and then the contrast is so stark that um, it yeah, it's like you know if you ever um, if you've been at the gym and you know you go in like the sauna or the steam room, mm -hmm. and then you go and you if you turn the shower on as cold as it can possibly go. And you have that shock. Yeah. yeah. I mean, that, it's like something like that. Uh, so, I, it's hard, it's even hard for me to put to words just how bland life feels coming out of an episode like that. Bland is a very unique word. Yeah. Um, I mean, I really, I, I just, had almost no energy for anything and mm -hmm. I felt like such a screw up and um, uh, I really that's unfortunate yeah that's an unfortunate feeling to have feeling like a screw up coming out of an episode because it's like you don't really control anything you're you're kind of being led by the nose yellow <clears throat> you said yellow yeah What the? 
Dude, these reverse cards in a two-person game are <laughs> so powerful. A um, game changer. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's 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 just hard as a young person. Yeah, blue. Is that what you're saying? Yeah. 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 And and you also have to draw four. Oh shoot. And. I feel like we're at a casino right now. Every time I do the finger thing, yeah. I'm like, oh, it's two taps. I need something happen here. Yeah. Something vicious is happening here. That was vicious. Right in front of the friends and family deal. Yeah. Um, so, um. You know what up? Unbelievable. <laughs> Sensational. Yeah. Sensational. It was sensational, dude. It just gets in that gap, that pocket. I had two wild cards and like all reds and all yellows. Wow. And at the beginning of the game, I was like, wow, like, you know, if things line up well, like, mm -hmm. I'm going to just shout these wilds and get out of here. <laughs> <laughs> but that's I'm just going to skedaddle, man. Yeah, I'm just going to skedaddle, but that's not how this game works. So, yeah, it's, uh, I think we'll get to it throughout the story today this might even be a good transition into um coming out of go you know last time we ended we were talking about the psychiatrist that i had and yeah. coming out of the hospital tell me more about her and how that played into the next chapter of the story so when i came out of the hospital i wasn't allowed to leave the state of missouri for more than like two days three days were they afraid you were going to be a flight risk no because when you're adjusting, I think this was why. Mm -hmm. Well, one, I didn't have a psychiatrist at that time, and in DC mm -hmm. or anywhere else, yeah. um, who would, and so I couldn't even do any like telemedicine or anything. So because I was in such a volatile state, mm -hmm. it, Remember, I, remind me what year this was. Summer of 2021. Mm -hmm. So it's like two and a half, three years ago. Yeah. Um, so I wasn't allowed to leave the state of Missouri. Other than I, I took a weekend trip to see my family at the beach, and I was not in great shape. Mm -hmm. um, the so I went to the hospital towards the middle end of July, mm -hmm. and then for the next month, you know, classes were gonna start around the week before Memorial Day, maybe two weeks before Memorial Day. Yeah, I was just really alone in St. Louis. Like people so were there nice working day. for the summer, but then most people cleared out. Mm -hmm. And I would go and I would get my blood drawn um, a few times a week because they have to monitor your lithium levels when you're getting adjusted to the medication. Mm -hmm. And uh, did they ever explain what that's for? Yeah, I mean, it's just if you're you, if your lithium level is too high, it can do damage to your kidneys. Mm -hmm. um, so the goal, and also there's a the main reason why is that you need to be at a therapeutic dosage of lithium. Mm -hmm. So the lithium content in your bloodstream needs to be between around like 0.8 and 1.2. Mm -hmm. I forget what the um, metric, the, the stat is or the, the, that measures it, but those are the, the numbers that's, uh, or just, it's just your blood lithium level. Yeah. So, you know, like what percentage of your blood essentially is, is lithium, I think. Mm -hmm. Um, I know that has to be a crazy yeah. balance to strike. So, is that you or me? Uh, that was me. Okay, that was you. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, I was doing the blood, and also you have to taper up to your dose, so you can't. Green. Okay, you can't just throw someone on on lithium mm -hmm. day one. I mean, like any medication, whether it's lithium or or something for ADHD like Adderall or or an antipsychotic or. Uh, mood, any 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 class of drugs you taper up on mm -hmm. lithium in particular yeah, so it took it a mean to taper. go from a low dose to your optimal level or higher okay cool. so like in the case of um i i can i can tell you that like ritalin or concerta mm -hmm. they have the, the the lowest dose they typically offer is around like 18 milligrams i believe yeah. and then there's another one at like 27 and then there's 36 and then there's 
uh, maybe even 45s, which are pretty high. Mm-hmm. And you'd start at 18 and, and, and work your way up over the course of a few weeks to whatever is right. Yeah. The bigger you are, probably the heavier the dose you're going to need to be on. Mm-hmm. At least, like, well, actually, one thing that's weird for me with lithium mm-hmm. is like, I'm going a million directions right now, so I'm sorry if this is hard no, to no, to, no, to follow. I'm, 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 for me, yeah. this is learning as I'm yeah. going. So, so I'm on like a pretty high <laughs> dose of lithium, mm-hmm. but I'm pretty small. I don't know what that means, mm-hmm. you know, psychologically or physically, but um, you know, that's one I one where I think it's a little bit weirder. Like some people are on lower doses, some people are on higher, but the main thing is trying to get that that blood lithium level. Um, to an optimal point. Damn, did you play that too? Yeah, you did this three, and then I put your, my three on top of your three. Okay. Yeah. And, and I just drew, drew a on. card. I didn't know if you were waiting to go. No, know. no, no, it's all you. Okay. Um, we'll know out. God damn. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I won the first game, so. You did, I, no, yeah, you did. I'm you did. happy, you I'm your, happy you about that. You put your flag in the game on the first. Yeah, so. Yeah. To pivot back to where this originated, Mm -hmm. I was in St. Louis by myself and I was just kind of screwing around. Mm -hmm. Still, I was still in psychosis, still pretty manic, even Mm -hmm. taking the lithium Mm -hmm. and like just nothing was going well. So I'm still basically manic. Mm -hmm. I'm still psychotic. uh, Espresso running through your blood all crazy. Wasn't quite that level of, of energy, but it was like a light manic episode, like on a scale of one to ten, mm-hmm. it was like a four, mm-hmm. three or four. Um, Did you ever know? Can you could you ever tell that you were mid manic while it was going on? Uh-huh. Not really. Mm-hmm. After I, it's hard to remember, but I don't think I knew that I was still manic coming out of the hospital. Mm-hmm. When I left the hospital, I knew that something had I knew that I had experienced some sort of mental health crisis Mm -hmm. but I I thought that it was more (sighs) I really believed that I was doing things that were having a social impact on a broad level Mm -hmm. so i thought that going to the hospital was a repercussion for my actions Mm -hmm. i didn't think that it was treatment Mm -hmm. and it took me weeks to come to terms with with that like Mm -hmm. i mean i kind of understood it but i really thought people were pissed off at me Mm -hmm. and they thought that the things that i was saying were crazy Mm -hmm. um or that's like the fourth seven i've pulled yeah. After shuffling the deck, which is wild. Yeah. So, um, and I, I didn't really think mm-hmm. that that there was much wrong with with like what I was doing. Yeah. So coming out of the hospital, I was just kind of like, look, like you know, I need to calm down. Like I just got myself in big trouble. Mm-hmm. You know, I'm just gonna take a few weeks to just. That like, was your internal dialogue yeah, to yourself. Yeah. To my to Go myself, ahead. I was like. You know, let's just keep a lower p- profile, which I wasn't really doing. Mm-hmm. And, uh, oh, shit. Well, don't look down. Um, or sugar, honey, iced tea. Um, we're back? Yeah, we're back. Um, so, I, I just hung out. I wasn't doing the healthiest things. Mm-hmm. And then school rolled around. I, I you know there's not much to go into in that first month other than that I was like living pretty isolated in yeah. St. Louis. Few people were around, not many. Um, that sucks, man. Yeah, and you don't even have a good outlet or people to interact with when yeah. all this is happening. Yeah. So this is where things got tough with the the psychiatrist. Mm-hmm. I was clearly having a rough time. Yeah. And if you were in a one-on-one mm-hmm. meeting with me, yeah. prescribing meds and trying to figure out what was going on, mm-hmm. it would be abundantly clear that I probably was not going to be able to go back to school mm-hmm. and that I probably needed to, like, I, there were certain things that I needed to address. You needed more support. I needed support. Yeah. I needed, 
I needed a to environment. I needed to get the meds right. I needed everything. Yeah. Um, but I was just not in particular ready to go back to school. And that's a very important part of your mental health battle in general. Yeah. 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 So. <clears throat> um. So she kept saying, mm-hmm. you know, oh, he'll, you know, he'll be able to go. Can I play that card that I just drew? Sure. Okay. Uh, we'll go blue. Cool. So she would say, you know, you, you know, you should try going back to school. Maybe the work will be helpful. Mm-hmm. Um, and then I tried going back and it just ramped everything up for me. Like the social stimulation of being on campus, like the first week of people going out and partying. And Did you pick a color? I said blue, yeah. So I just ramped up again to like level, you know, high level mania within a week of classes starting and I started skipping all my classes and Did you ever watch Dragon Ball Z? Uh no. They have a part where the um <clears throat> the Saiyans invade Earth and when they get a measurement when the Saiyans get a measurement of Goku, it's like, Oh my god, he's at level this is either six thousand or nine thousand, but it's like he's at level nine thousand and that was like a big deal. That's like what you sound like in the story yeah. like you you realize like oh this is it <clears throat> this is easily it you could go ahead and play something yeah i mean there's okay um mm-hmm. there was definite it was it gradually got up to that level high level nine thousand, like dragon ball z mm-hmm. and i remember t- i had a meeting with my psychiatrist and mm-hmm. I was just telling her what was going through Uno mm-hmm. um, I was telling her what was going through my head and like I said you know if you know you don't tell me what's going on right now then I'm gonna protest and like I'm gonna do a bunch of crazy stuff and mm-hmm. um, gonna make things very difficult for everyone around me Yeah, and she just didn't really do much to warn my parents or about this bill about what well, yeah and she wasn't really keeping them informed mm-hmm. she wasn't really communicative with me she was very passive and so it was just kind of like i was off on my own and there was no no support no communication it was just kind of every time i'd sit down with her it was just sort of like it, it felt like I was like a, in, you know, a research experiment. Like she would just kind of look at me and study me and ask me questions and she would never really, you know, do anything to, any responses. to, yeah, to, yeah. to respond to it. Um, <coughs> so I, I ended up, you know, doing what I told her I was going to do and spent a day or two just kind of running rampant mm-hmm. and my you know uh, nice my mom came out and brought me back to dc and then i you know we our family made a decision that you know this psychiatrist was probably not the right person for me because she led me back to school she wasn't there was no communication with my parents she wasn't really providing any practical suggestions for how to to deal with the situation. There were zero, zero guardrails. There's just no no guardrails. And she was just a particularly kind of difficult individual. How so? A little Do bit. You mean in the passiveness, the communication yeah. department are just all around? Well. When you look back at it. I think, yeah, the passiveness and whatnot. And she, maybe I should have uh, This particular physician, I think, was fairly grounded in her research and then made the transition into more clinical work. Um, And she never turned that research part off. Yeah. And you could kind of tell her research was the goal and anything else was secondary. I mean, I don't want to psychoanalyze it too much. No, but I mean, it is your experience. But I think, I think regardless of that like Mm -hmm. just her background was not rooted in you know clinical treatment and and working with patients Mm -hmm. and so 
she just was kind of cold and investigative and um that sounds like a brick yeah it was just i have i had a lot of thoughts i also wasn't in the greatest state myself so i want to be careful with my words but um college kids are tough people to to work with their mental health because they drink a lot and they you know do drugs and um so it's very i think tough to analyze like why they're feeling the way that they do and what they're how motivated they are to feel better and yeah. um <clears throat> so i don't know if i think for people for the for someone whose job was like she was a walk maybe i'm like doxing her right now but um this person worked at a university mm -hmm. and they spend all of their time treating college aged kids mm -hmm. so if that's what you're going to sign up for then you know what you're getting yourself into and like part of that is going to involve working with people who have like, substance abuse issues mm -hmm. and they're at this particular school are overly privileged or they're you know sex addicts or they like aren't ready to come to terms with their mental health mm -hmm. issues and they Which that's on both sides yeah, yeah and that's that's everywhere but there's just like all sorts of issues particularly with college kids as they are in that those first few years of independence away from home mm -hmm. and it's so if if that's where you're going to be then you need to be ready to help launch some you know you, you need to understand that that what yeah just what you're signing up for i don't think she i don't think she was prepared to work with yeah with college age kids yeah. so she was not uh realistic about working with that population no she wasn't realistic about life <laughs> i got you yeah <clears throat> um draw four we'll do blue mm -hmm. So, yeah, I just... Draw I, four, we'll do red. Just never felt particularly great leaving any kinds of meetings with her. And mm -hmm. we talked last time about how she had set me up with that medication Which without doing much homework. And mm -hmm. um, so I don't have the greatest things to say, but I went... So I, that's the end of her. And mm -hmm. thankfully, we won't have to talk about her again. Yeah, um, yeah. Because I went home, we got rid of her, and that was when I, my mom helped me find, which, you know, a total 180 from where we were mm -hmm. a year and a half before. Yeah. She helped me now find a psychiatrist who could also do my therapy mm -hmm. at the same time yeah. in Washington. And which was a nice change of pace. Nice change of pace, and yeah. now my family is, like, totally on board with helping me get to... A, a better place and do you remember how long that took to find a new therapist because with how bad that relationship with was with the last therapist technically speaking you didn't have to immediately get a new therapist but your parents made sure like hey let's do what we can on or psych own. psychiatrist mm -hmm. in this case yeah so i still had a therapist in st in st louis mm -hmm. outside of this demonic woman yeah. and um and he and I worked together throughout graduating last year. That's the one who's here right now. No, he's still in St. Louis. Okay. Just I had, like we said, yeah. so I, there was a silver lining. There was yeah. a silver lining guy that stepped in at a certain point. But so mm -hmm. it's just that I've wore, I had I had a therapist and a psychiatrist mm -hmm. in St. Louis, mm -hmm. and then in D.C. Mm -hmm. I have a guy who does both together. Yeah. So I've worked with three people throughout my recovery. Mm -hmm. And I don't really like that word, but because I, yeah, because it's like I haven't recovered. I'm still struggling with stuff, but mm -hmm. throughout my response or whatever, but um, throughout, yeah, throughout the recuperation, um, and also it's uh, it's mm -hmm. in my move on. Yeah, yeah. That yeah. Already. So I, my mom found this guy mm -hmm. within 
days of coming home from St. Louis. This is like September of 2021. Yeah. Um, and so... Nice. Nice. So she found this guy fast and he's just incredible. Um, one thing I, I really like about him. No, okay. Well, no, cool. You're good. You got no, I'm not. Cards. No, yeah, I've got three yeah, cards. No, you got two cards. Yeah. Like, hey, you got the cards. All right. That works. So, oh, yeah. One thing I like about this guy, though, uh, mm -hmm. is it from it's soon. Wow, we're about to have all four threes done. Are we? Yeah. One, two, three, four. Um, Skip you. Yellow. Okay. Um. So one thing I, I've liked about him from the day that I met him, blue, blue. from the day that I'm that I met him, yeah, Uno, one, um, is that he's grounded in working with adolescents. He works primarily um, with people, you know, toddlers like age three through uh, or like kindergarten through high school, mm -hmm. and so he really understands a lot of the where my tendencies are rooted or certain traumatic experiences and um and i think that it's a huge asset for a young person in therapy even if they're not of that age is if you're working with a provider who understands how like kids work mm -hmm. and you're you're coming into your adulthood they'll have a lot of insight on, on what makes you tick. Yeah. And so, you know, I start working with him and- Which plays into the background that you talked about on how important yeah. it is to understand. So I started, I started working with him mm -hmm. and the goal was kind of to, okay, Uno, the goal was to get back to St. Louis within a month or so and start a job there and try and get myself back on my feet. I just kind of wanted to warrior it and power through everything. Yeah. And you know, meanwhile, I'm still smoking weed all the time, and I'm. I think my goals were so oriented towards, you know, were just so oriented towards whatever idea of normalcy that I had in my head was, rather than uh, blue, Uno, Uno out. Um, no, that's that's wrong. You just put down a green draw too. Which is a, a skip. Yeah. Yeah. That color is in a blue. That's not a white. Oh blue. shit! I just showed my. <laughs> yeah. Wait, you draw two first. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's not great. <clears throat> All right. Well, now you know not to play a blue card. Um. Did you? Well, you have to draw a card now. Because I played that. Yeah. So. <laughs> So I was just trying to get back to normalcy. Mm -hmm. and four. Reverse to me, reverse to me, we go out. Unbelievable. <laughs> I was like, I have no idea how I'm gonna pull this off. And I looked at it, I was like, oh okay, I'm having a Yu-Gi-Oh moment. Nice. Yeah. <clears throat> you had you had that but yellow like, yellow brick road right in front yeah, of you. Yeah. Yeah. So <clears throat> So I went, I worked with him for a month. Mm -hmm. I wasn't feeling great, but I was like, I was, yeah, I wasn't feeling great, but I definitely hadn't hit rock bottom of depression yet. I, I just, I was just kind of, I was motivated and looking forward to kind of getting back to St. Louis. And I, I had all this hope in my head that I wasn't crazy over the summer. And, you know, some of my delusions were true still. And, I was like, I was, you know, I was going crazy, but I'm not that crazy. I was like, something was going on. Is there a certain amount of hope for your delusion when you're in that period? Like, I hope this is real or I hope there's something that I can accomplish with this. Yeah, I mean, there's, yeah, yeah. But I, th yeah, especially like after it happened the first time, there were just so many things I was pointing to in my head thinking, well, there's got to be something going on here. Mm -hmm. And... So I just maintained that hope and made it back to the Midwest after a month of being in DC. Mm -hmm. And pretty quickly I started to get, I, I got a job working at Smoothie King. Mm -hmm. I got an internship working for a organization in, in St. Louis that I was passionate about. 
And so I was working two things and you know, making a little money and able to hang out with my college friends and, and live with them. I was very sad about potentially missing out on like senior year and I'd been through three years of school where I wanted to just finish out and be a part of everything with them. Yeah. And so after a few weeks of being in St. Louis though, I just started to crash. Like it wasn't wasn't quite rock bottom yet, but I was losing like the motivation that I'd had even when I was depressed the previous year and I still didn't have a psychiatrist in St. Louis. All of the psychiatrists that I was meeting with were like uh I don't know, I met with I met with one woman that I just really didn't like. Mm -hmm. Um and uh, it was just a, a a period in my life where, again, I'm I'm just trying to to get to this idea of normalcy. Yep. And one thing I was unable to accept was, well, you know, the more and more I try and focus on normal, the farther away I'm gonna get from it. Mm -hmm. So, draw two. Yeah. Um, do you think looking back as you were losing motivation do you think there were things you did to keep yourself motivated in terms of finding help <clears throat> uh, I mean I always I always believed in myself to a certain extent Yeah. Um, I mean when I get depressed I'm Um, well, when I was depressed at, when I was depressed in that period and it got to its lowest, my mentality was sort of like, it was very hard on myself kind of how how could I let this happen and a little bit of a little bit of you know the the world has failed me a little bit too but I definitely maintained hope that like things would be okay and it gets complicated because After that depressive period, I went manic again, mm -hmm. and I just kept setting these deadlines for myself where I was I had accepted that at some point I was going to need to do something about this, mm -hmm. and eventually I just said, all right, if I don't snap out of the, if, if the things that, if my delusions don't go away by this point in time which for me was like july of 2022 mm -hmm. then i'll do whatever anyone tells me to do like i'll throw my hands in the air and, and just listen to the professionals every everything that they say like you know i was rejecting a lot of advice at that time um red and so Just to, in terms of that motivation, um, I don't know. It was during the depressive periods, like I lost most of it. Um, it's it's pretty hard to 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 talk about it because it's not the most. Um, like last time we we talked, we talked about the. The, the way that, the, you know, I you see life in different shades and the colors change and the weather changes around you yeah. when you're depressed. And, I mean, in the fall of 2021 and into the winter and 
until I kind of went manic again. And that manic episode kind of saved my life in some ways. How so? Because I was so depressed in December and January of 2021 into 2022. I mean, I don't want to go into too much detail, but I'll just say that the thing that flipped the switch for me from like super intense, dark thoughts in that SI realm to having some motivation to like kind of live again and try and have fun and, and maybe, you know, pursue some even healthier habits. I like was going manic um, yeah. because I just had this like inflated self image and that was that gave me more purpose than the the depression did on a day to day basis. It wasn't sustainable though. Mm -hmm. um, and still, then, that's an amazing takeaway from that moment. Uh, green and also Uno. Yeah, I mean, and I definitely believe that, <laughs> or I don't believe it's something to believe in. Uno. Okay, um, but the change in my outlook from being as depressed as I was mm -hmm. in the winter of 2021, 2022. Yeah. To mania was night and day. Um, and then I just went manic again for several months. And because I'd already been to the hospital, I refused to go. Like, I, you know, I, my mom would tell me maybe we should do the hospital. I'd, no therapist well maybe you know if you don't feel well and i would always say so when i was manic i was like what can i do to feel better like i can't turn my brain off my thoughts are spinning like i just don't feel well like what can i do what can i do or mm -hmm. how can you make this all go away i just feel like i'm being watched all the time and everyone knows things that i don't know and this and that and yeah it's scary and um i hated it um and they'd always just say, well, maybe the hospital or maybe this medication. I didn't like any of those answers. Mm -hmm. I still don't sometimes. Yeah. Um, and... Wait, what? I uh, shuffled the cards. I oh. put down a five. Oh. And then shuffled the cards and I put them underneath the deck. Okay. So, mm -hmm. I just spent the semester, like, very combative. I had to take another medical leave within a few weeks and I just kind of hung around there and and was sort of expecting that like I'd have my you know come to Jesus moment or like everything all of a sudden like like things would be great and 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 make sense mm -hmm. and um it went from mid-January to April all right I went home in 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 March for a little bit just to get away from St. Louis, things were starting to get a little bit harder there. Mm -hmm. And then I came back to St. Louis on a few occasions during April, and I remember one of them they had this like big fundraiser night for this organization on campus, and they threw a big party. And I started... I don't even really remember what the straw that broke the camel's back was that night. Mm -hmm. But my, you know, it got my mom's attention. It got my friend's attention. And I had just hit a brick wall. I was sending messages everywhere. Like smoking all day long like a chimney because that was the only thing that made me feel like I could slow my thoughts down mm -hmm. and then I went to the benefit thing and um, was just so out of it I mean I probably only said a couple words the whole night I mean maybe I'm a pretty talkative person so maybe couple for me is like a few hundred but you know i yeah but but i was pre like mm -hmm. in my head yeah um and then i zoned in to the point you were yeah. zoned out and so that weekend i <clears throat> like 
I just crashed so hard that my dad had to come out and I knew because I'd been manic for, I'd been, I, I need to stop for a sec. Um, I'd been manic for months, but like I said, the physical symptoms are underrated. Yeah. And that weekend, everything mentally became physical too. And I, I was just throwing up all night long and going through like, you know, I, I, my body felt like it had like pins and needles all the time. And mm -hmm. I was just, I just felt so unhealthy and I remember my mom saying, you know, you need to, you need to go back to the hospital at this point. Like that's the first step. Like we're going to get you help, mm -hmm. but do us a favor and like, let's hit the reset button here and, and, and see what they have to say. Yeah. And so I flew home to DC. I didn't want to go to the hospital in St. Louis. Um, and my, my doctor or psychiatrist at the time was in DC overseeing everything in St. Louis, which also wasn't the wisest thing. Mm -hmm. It's better to have someone in the city that you're in. So I eventually made that change, but, um, but he, you know, recommended, um, Sibley here. So I went there and, uh, didn't, didn't necessarily help immediately, but it helped me come to terms with the fact that you know I was not making healthy decisions I I tried to justify a lot of it internally yeah. while I was manic th through you know the delusional thoughts that I was having and saying you know what I'm doing right now is really entertaining or it, uh, like socially impactful or X, Y, or Z. But even then, none of it was very healthy. And so when I went to the hospital, that was when I knew, like, I needed to, I needed to slow down. And I figured... They were trying to slow me down and, and get me ready for the summer sling. Cause I really thought like something crazy was happening in my life. Mm -hmm. I still thought all this, you know, X-Men kind of crazy. Yeah. They're trying to get whatever they can get. Mm -hmm. Um, but I, but would you say around this time where you bought in or were you at the finish line of, okay, whatever happens at this point, we have to just be bought into whatever they say. I was just like, I'll do anything to feel normal again. Yeah. Like, I'll do anything to feel like I am in, in control of my own life. And and I'll do anything to, to feel something. I just wasn't, I wasn't feeling anything anymore. Like, I, I wasn't feeling anything when I was depressed. And then when I was manic, I would feel stuff because I was manic. So I would just be high on delusional content all day long and then eventually i'm just burning out and and uh so i just i remember i came out of the hospital and spent a few weeks just chilling around washington and went back to st louis to pack up my apartment and and settled in here for the summer just doing nothing and didn't didn't want to have a job didn't want to do anything i just lived in my parents house and smoked weed and um the overwhelming thing i remember was sitting down to turn on a movie or sports or go out and even with the delusions which i was still having to a certain extent I just didn't really feel anything. Like I, I really, uh, I was someone who grew up always living for the moment and excited to be around people and play Uno and, and go out and have dinner and go to sporting events and listen to 
you know, the radio, and I get random things. But I, I could find fun in, in, in lots of different activities, and there was just nothing in my life that brought me joy. Um, and this may be probably a little dramatic, but it, it's really, it was almost nothing. Um, I don't think this is dramatic. I think yeah. this is honest. Yeah. Yeah. Because um, I, you know, I went to treatment in July of that year. It's now 2022. And when I went to treatment, I remember emphasizing to the, you know, counselors there, like, I just want to be able to enjoy watching a movie again. Like, you know, I just want to be able to enjoy doing things again. And they sat us down on our first day, like, what do you like to do for fun? Because I wanted to orient activities and stuff towards what we would engage with. Well, and I was just, remember that was like that, the hardest question I ever had to answer. I was like, I don't enjoy anything. Like, um, so I came out of the hospital, spent two and a half months in DC. I really wasn't having a great time. I wasn't doing anything. I was just screwing around all day long. Like, um, and seeing friends and it still was pretty hard. And I, uh, I guess at some point in June or early July, I made arrangements to go to, uh, treatment facility um, in Atlanta and um, I don't know it was the, the main reason I went to treatment was because I remembered coming out of mania the first time around and how depressed I was And I just wanted to avoid that crash. And if I did crash, have support around me to get through it. Yeah. And believe me, like I crashed again in Atlanta, like probably j yeah, just as bad, if not worse than the, the first time, the first time around. But I had people around me that uh, knew how to respond to, to that level of depression and you know this is like this is hard stuff to to reconcile with and even articulate yeah. um and i knew coming into our conversation today that it would be because it's just like um it's a time it's a time in my life that i don't really remember much yeah. Um, and for the little that you do remember, for this to be the memories. Yeah. Um, and that that's how I knew. That was another thing about the depression. Like, I have a pretty good memory mm -hmm. in general. And the depression kind of zapped my memory to the point where, like, I still have memory issues right now between the depression and the pot. Um, it's gotten a lot better. Um, so I don't, I'm not going to complain about my memory anymore, but it's definitely not what it used to be. Mm -hmm. And the depression is just as much a part of that as the pot was. And those like the fall of 2021 into the winter and same period of time in 2022, I really just don't remember very much other than the overwhelming, really dark, like thoughts that I was having. I mean, it's not like, you know, I blacked out for months. Like, I can tell you that I was in Atlanta and I went to treatment and these were the people that I was with and these were a few of the places that we ate and went. And But, like, for the most part, it's just a very dim mm -hmm. past. I really don't have vivid, like, memories of a lot of it. Um, so this particularly the first time that I got depressed like when I came home and then went to St. Louis and um, right before that mania kind of brought me out of everything again yeah the booster shot the booster shot yeah but it really it's I just don't have I'm just kind of lost for words
Yeah. When it comes to that experience of feeling lost in your own experience, what do you do to remind yourself that it's okay to feel lost because there's better around the corner? Um, well, yeah, it's, I mean, it's hard, you know, I can't say that I was doing anything like that very, very well when I was at my lowest, I think coming out of the lows and over the past two years or a year and a half where things have gotten much better, I've started to be able to remind myself that things get better around the corner yeah. through developing routine and like the, the kind of just the small wins. Um, also, just developing like redeveloping your competence and basic activities um so i don't know i i'll say this i went to that treatment place in july of 2022 at the time before I left, I was smoking a lot of weed, and then I, when I went there, cut all of that out, um, which included, you know, alcohol too. Mm -hmm. I didn't really have a drinking problem, yeah. but I but needed you knew to. That you didn't need it either. Yeah, I didn't. The, yeah. Anyway, I was like, all right, you know, why not cut it all out? Especially because uh, even if you don't have a, even if you don't have a drinking problem or you're not mm -hmm. alcoholic, whatever. Like the way it, or everyone's relationship with alcohol screws with their head a, a little bit. Um, but it helped to get to get kind of grounded. It helped me to get grounded more in in just very like basic pleasures again because then I, like you know that happiness around the corner in dark times is easier to reach and you just don't really think of the corner as like life itself or these next three months or the corner is more of a day-to-day -day grind than a, like a, just everything in front of you yeah. so um for me that's that's what's been helpful is just waking up in the morning and you know knowing what i need to take care of focusing on that mm. and you know it doesn't mean i don't ever consider the long term but then i know like oh you know the end of a long day like i can enjoy some ice cream or go to the gym or um see my parents or read a book like reading was really big at one point and you're also back in a space yeah where you could actually enjoy the things that used to bring you joy yeah and so when i say space most people when they're talking about space they're talking about the room is messy i can't enjoy my plate of food until i clean the room up yeah for you that space is I can actually feel the sensation and the chemical reaction of joy mm -hmm. that I'm supposed to have that was missing in the story before. Yeah, I, I you know, happiness 24-7 is an illusion, but, like, there are certain things that should make you feel happy. Yeah. You know, um, and I just wasn't, I wasn't there. Do you ever give yourself credit? And the reason I ask is because I feel like you're really hard on yourself and your story because of everything that's happened, which is understandable. But 
as one of your new friends, mm -hmm. which is what I am, and someone that's heard your story, I think there's a lot for you to be proud of for still sticking with yourself. And I've I've seen you be happy and enjoy things and be able to be with your friends and also be able to step away and be like, ah, I need a moment. Yeah. You get what I, I'm saying? I mean here's the here's the the, the good news. Like mm -hmm. as far as my story goes, like yeah. this is kind of the last lap of despair. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I'm if we're running on the track right yeah. now, like yeah. this is the last few hundred feet of the really hard stuff mm -hmm. and I'm just kind of like wow, like we're almost there like yeah. it's gonna get a lot better in in a few moments here mm -hmm. and so I mean I'm definitely hard on myself yeah. um, but it's just it's hard for me to revisit some of those some of those memories which are there mm -hmm. and uh, yeah I mean I don't know um, it's yeah I'm, I'm definitely hard on myself I'm still struggling you know like I everything has gotten a lot better and I'm, I'm in a pretty good place right now and I'm I'm really enjoying life or at least I feel like I have a little bit more agency than I have had in a long time. Mm -hmm. Um, that being said, like, you know, we talked about it last time. Um, we sat down for the first part of this conversation, just the way that I approach it is a little bit different and I'm, I'm, I'm hard on myself, but I'm not very like, self degrading anymore in terms of my dialogue around my sadness and um there's just certain things in the world in my life like that that are going to make me a little bit sad and there are certain triggers that I'll have on a daily basis which are all which bring me back into mania and there are certain people that I'll see um, that will remind me of moments where I like, wasn't exactly happy. Um, Rare form. Hmm? Rare form. Yeah. 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 So, but it's just, it's just different now. I, I mean, oh, yeah. When you say you've changed your approach, how so? Like, if you could think of an example of how you changed your approach from before compared to now. Um, I think, for one, the, the, my, my dialogue, like I said, around, um, the conflict in my life internally or externally is much more open. Um, so everything is more focused on my agency and, and kind of addressing things than it is on just like beating myself up. Um, <clears throat> two, I think I have placed a higher priority again on like getting to the gym that's been pretty big um and and i hate to say this one but there's certainly an element of just like tolerance that exists and so because i've been through certain things it like the stuff that i deal with right now like bales in comparison so um there's just an element of like when i wake up in the morning like i'm just very happy to be here and, and not two years ago and i think that so that is probably a testament to certain things that i do in my day-to-day -day or weekly life but 
they're very basic and I think whatever I'm most of the things that I do are things that like they're a good therapist would, would recommend for someone shout out to you no I mean um there's I mean there's other things that I that I could do better with in terms of sleep and um hey 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 it's still one thing at a time. Yeah, it's one. It's no. It's, <laughs> it's still one thing at a time. It's, we, we don't want to lose the narrative on that. Yeah, it's one thing at a time. Um, <clears throat> but the biggest thing that changed when I really turned a corner, mm-hmm. more. I don't know. I hope it's somewhat permanent, but um, at least where I've when I turned a corner that's allowed me to keep moving over the past year and a half, two years, and, you know, graduate and get a job and, and get on my feet and, and be pretty happy again, mm-hmm. you know, to, to start getting home safe, as you might say, yeah. is is that, is like the gratitude piece. And I just started to focus more on the things that I had in my life. And um, I mean, like you said, I'm pretty hard on myself. So, um, but I think I think you're hard on yourself because you feel a sense of responsibility for a lot of the actions for who you were in the story. And I think parts of your story, to me, prove that you didn't even know when the thing was happening. You feel what I'm saying? Like, mm-hmm. especially that last story of something hit the fan and everybody knew, hey, we need to get him help. Yeah, and at no point in your own story while living it were you aware stuff's going south. Yeah, and but the moments and the stories you've told me where you were aware things were going south, or you, or you became more aware that the fall was happening. There's always been a willingness, even if you didn't believe what the professionals were saying for you to at least try to go through the process Mm -hmm. and there's a lot of people who just fight back on the process and that's it like you know not taking the medication not going to therapy not even trying to hear out what's going on Mm -hmm. and i don't know if you do but i think you should give yourself more credit for being able to see it through and still be grateful for those who were around you when it was happening and still are around you to this day. Yeah. 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 That's like the best way to put it. Yeah. And I'm definitely grateful for it all. Yeah. Um, I don't know. Sometimes I'm just still kind of in disbelief about all of it. And... Um... Yeah. So, yeah. yeah. I don't. I don't really know why, like, things are so much better now than they were a year and a half ago. I gotta say, I went to treatment. Um, I eliminated the substance element from my life. Um, you know, reevaluated and reconfigured my relationship with it. Um, you know, tried to. Um, get the medication right found a new psychiatrist in St. Louis who really worked well for me got back in the gym your story sounds like a 76ers moment you know trust the process yeah there's it's funny you say that actually because when I went to treatment they gave us these like notebooks Mm -hmm. and on the first day we were designing them and I just wrote trust the process on on mine and there's there, there's certainly a, a lot of that there and you've that's manif- you you've manifested certain moments into your life yeah so um but yeah maybe maybe I am just being hard on myself in this conversation I don't know yeah because yeah. it, it got a lot better I really you know, I, I went back to school. I went to therapy. I started going twice a week instead of once a week. I, you know, 
stayed on the medications that I needed to, kept an open dialogue around all of it, mm-hmm. was in the gym damn near every day. You had people around yeah. you that you could trust. Yeah, I had, I had people around me that I could trust or at least kept them, you know, tapped into what could be helpful or how they could how they could help me. Mm-hmm. Allowed myself to really have fun. Like, yeah, took which a few, I know must have been hard. Yeah, it was because it had been a while. And to, to especially since with COVID and everything, like mm-hmm. last year was really the first time that I'd been traveling a little bit again, got out, saw a few new cities, reconnected with some people I hadn't seen in a long time. Um, I think I really dug into parts of my academics a little bit more. I, whew, I don't know. I just tried to to dig into to what was in front of me. And in the previous year, I tried to avoid everything that was in front of me. Um, and I was, I was just very scared and invulnerable. And now I'm just a little bit more comfortable with um, the, the idea of failure. Um, so. Fail fast. Mm-hmm. is um, there's this YouTube channel I've been watching on tech because you know I do cloud architecture and in order to be a cloud architect you need to understand the mind of an engineer mm-hmm. and the guy who runs the channel he used to work for Netflix just recently moved on from Netflix been there with that company for eight years and the correlation in this conversation to what he was talking about is when it comes to teams and when it comes to JavaScript, working on projects and programs, your job as an engineer or anyone in a company is to fail fast. Because mm-hmm. the faster you fail, the faster you figure out, all right, this is what we need to do with the next steps in order to get better. And from a societal point, most of us are afraid to fail because we associate right failure with there's no more future we associate failure with we've let people down but from what i've learned from my past dealings and a lot of stuff that i've Mm -hmm. done and worked on myself you're supposed to fail you're supposed to look forward to the fail you're not defined by how much you failed you're defined by all right what did you learn from your failures or when you failed did you do everything you could to ignore the failure? So the difference between someone who takes responsibility for what they did in a story and where they can change it, you actually see those changes implemented versus someone who, when they fail, it seems to always be someone's fault and they're never responsible for anything right. that's happened in the story. Yeah. Even myself, like, when I tell my story or stories that I'm part of, relationships that didn't work out, people who I no longer work with, I'm very quick to show where I could have handled things better or what I should have done before it's the other person's fault. And I don't have an issue with saying who did what or why, but I do have an issue in not pointing out my part and how that played into what happened and what led to things. Yeah. I think you've done a great job. I know it's hard. It. And I know looking back, you know, from there to now, mm-hmm. you still have hope. Well, that, because you're getting better also and you're working on things still. Yeah. Right? But I'd like for there to be an understanding for you to understand that to this point, I think you have gone beyond what you thought your best would have been in that story. Yeah. Well, the, the, the thing I'm being hardest on myself about right now in this moment is like, I just wish there there was something I could say that would illuminate you know, clearly why things have gotten better. I wish I had more stories that I could tell from the past, you know, year and a half. Like, have you not watched the interview that you put up already that's, like, on my channel? Like, I have, yeah. Yeah, I think, I think you've shared enough. Yeah. I think, yeah. I think it's... I think it's asinine to always expect fruit to have the juice that you're squeezing for. Right. You feel me? Like, yeah. Not... Not every orange in a batch of oranges is going to be the same amount. Yeah. So, yeah. you know, what you can get cool. And I don't bring you on here to make everything into an explosion. Sometimes it's like, hey, yeah. 
we have fireworks and some of them aren't gonna go off and some of them do at the cookout yeah at the cookout it's gonna be very rare that your last bite was the best bite in a plate yeah yeah and i mean fire fireworks aside you know more you know um just at least having i guess some insight or, or more suggestions into rebounding but but i think that's the larger lesson is like there's a lot of really small, simple things that you can do that go a long way. Mm -hmm. And and it sounds really stupid um, when you're down bad. Um, I don't think so. <laughs> well, I, think, I think when you're down bad, it's very hard to see reality for what it is. Yeah. Because well, you, you've experienced a lot right. of bad stuff. You're not just seeing it for free or for yeah. you know giggles. You, you were in it. It's very hard to be someone who's in it and all of a sudden you're just not in it anymore. And it's like, nah, when you're when you're in something, there's an expectation, hey, the thing will go wrong mm -hmm. after a while. Yep. And finding that is just as hard as getting back to who you were before everything happened. Yep. Well, the, yeah, the, yeah, I just think if you're down bad, if you're that depressed or you're, if you're, if you're going through some sort of mental health related episode, any advice people give you is just going to sound like, well, that's not going to solve my problems because if you do it that day, you're probably not going to feel better. Um, <laughs> so, strong. yeah. So it, you, it versus like you take an Advil or whatever, it might relieve some of your headache pain. Mm -hmm. So, um, like you said, trust the process and chipping away at it um, brings the big gains. Yeah, it's... Yeah. Um, the difference between a journey and a trip is you have a great understanding of how long the trip will take mm -hmm. for a journey you get there when you get there yeah no watch is going to tell you anything you don't know before you took that first step or after you take that last step yeah all right, I feel like this is a great place to end the interview.